everybody. Welcome to our TRC 57 speaker series. Uh, I'll be your host today, joined with my uh, great friends, uh, Stephanie Johnson and Lawrence Mitchell. Uh, and our guests today, uh, Keith and Linda Goulet. I'm talking to you from the uh, traditional unceded territories of the Snanemoch peoples. Um, and I know that you're joining us from all across this great lands and are, are all on the unceded traditional territories of the peoples who've looked after these lands since time immemorial. This is our uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, uh, TRC 57 speaker series, and it's part of our work at the Denimo Lady Smith Public Schools and our efforts to learn how to walk better on the territories uh, and for the families and students in which we serve. And so we've been on this path for about a year and a half now, and uh, we are joined together, as I say, from one of our knowledge keepers as part of this journey, uh, Mr. Lawrence Mitchell. So I'll turn it to you, Lawrence, please, to open the house for us. I just got to see it. Dihuam tse i amastalh a quilla ay squalawan. Dihuam slachan tustadikith. E dihuam latlamatha tset at the selchanst. Ti we yath tan quaswa kikalis e kaki misdemoch. Dihuam slathakan stoch tanuts walmoch. Haichka at the high all ay squail a tanaquail. Hajka kwans nanu tliat limith na washwam kums danasali atana quail eater mux quail storms there.
Mm. I just kind of say I'm my friend uh, for creating that uh, sacred space around us today so we can have this conversation and share this learning from our, our relatives. Uh, I'm assuming, uh, Linda and Keith, that you are in Saskatchewan today, but with Zoom, you could be anywhere. <laughs> yes, that's true, but we yes. are Good. in our that's home good. in Saskatchewan in Prince Albert. Well, it's wonderful to have you with us today uh, for our uh, participants and our audience out there. Uh, I'm quite thrilled to have uh, Linda and Keith join us. I've lived on the, this territory here where Hulkamitnam uh, has been the language and from for about the last 50 years. Uh, and as a teacher on this territory too, I get to spend time with a, a language speaker and a language teacher and a teacher. Uh, so it's uh, it's quite a thrill for me and I'm sure for all of our participants as well. So Keith and Linda, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you, uh, our two authors and uh, knowledge keepers uh, to talk about your learnings and the things that you've come to understand that you've put so beautifully together in your book, uh, Teaching Each Other. So I talk uh, for being with us today. Thank you, Ted. Thank you for hosting this Zoom meeting as we all, I don't know about other teachers, but as we adjust to using technology so much more in our lives. Uh, so yes, Stephanie, uh, thank you so much for your tech support in making this a seamless uh, effort to get into Zoom. And Lawrence, thank you for opening us in a good way. And just appreciation to the Lincoln and Heimel Lady Smith Public School uh, District and UP UBC Press for organizing this webinar. I think given the situation in Canada, uh, education for all of us um, regarding Indigenous issues is just really so important and so pertinent in today's climate. So, um, just give me a second Well, I, whoops, uh, figure out how to do this. I'm still a newbie uh, to uh, Zoom, so. Um, Perfect. So, I hope you can all see our PowerPoint screen. It looks great. Okay. So uh, Keith and I are husband and wife uh, who have worked together for how long have we been married now, dear? Uh, a little over 40 years ago, yes. Long time. Anyway, so just to give people in British Columbia and wherever else you are a sense of where we come from, Keith, do you want to? I, I'm so used to being in a room where I can point to the picture. Okay, can you see my little pointer? Okay, um, this, Keith, you want to just explain what this is? Oh yes, uh, we, we share a little bit in regards to the west where you have a, a, a lot of water on the coastlines and everything like that. I come from the largest inland delta of the North America. It's, uh, it's uh, quite large and uh, I was uh, therefore raised in a trapping fishing and hunting uh, situation. But uh, the land itself was uh, very, very important uh, for us and we call it uh, Nitaskina, our land. Very rich area in all kinds of animals on a major flyway, lots of birds. Um, anyway, I come from, whoops, that's not me. This is where I come from uh, down in the other slide here. I come from the bald prairies of Saskatchewan that have their own beauty. We call ourselves the land of living sky. Uh, and of course, being grandparents, we couldn't get through a PowerPoint without including at least one photo of our latest granddaughter. That's you. Oh, that's, uh, it's for my presentation now for who I am. Uh, but I still have to remember my, my grandchild. And uh, she has a, 
uh, a, a fairly uh, uh, Im important role. We've got three grandchildren and they're really, really great for us. When I was growing up in uh, Cumberland House, uh, we call it Cummins to go Scott, which means, um, you know, uh, Spruce Island. But uh, this uh, particular area where we were trapping was called Kaujuspi Skasik, which just meant, uh, you know, the, the place of the elders. And uh, if you look at the picture, you'll see that uh, in, this is uh, about 1950, uh, about 1950. And you'll see the picture, we had tents, uh, you know, on both sides of this, plus we had a, uh, a, a, a log cabin that we built. And you could see that we had a couple of families with us. There was, you know, two other three, four families, you know, usually in a, in a camp like this. We used to be out in uh, these areas for two months a year. Uh, usually in March and April. So we'd be out there on the land all the time. And uh, so I learned how to uh, uh, be quite adept at living off the land, even when I was a little guy. You could see right away that uh, uh, I'm right there on the right hand side. Uh, uh, you could predict already that uh, I would uh, be part of the educational system, you know, of nature, you know, when I was young, but also uh, you see the stump right beside there. I also was a, a cabinet minister and a, an MLA for the province for 17 years. So just in case, this is Keith's family. Uh, uh, his dad is in the middle. His mom is right here. And these other women are uh, part of the extended group that would come together uh, to trap in the spring and hunt. and. Of course, the extra women are the ones who do the skinning of the muskrats, mostly muskrats. In yeah, and, and you can see our form of travel at that time was by, but was by walking and by dog team. But you can see the dogs in the background. And for myself, uh, I learned about indigenous education. Um, I've always had indigenous people in my life. Uh, but of course, my one of my first teachers, uh, really in depth, is Keith, my husband. Uh, but also, I learned a lot working with elders <laughs> over the years, and also in my teaching practice, uh, I always taught, no matter where I went. I always had Indigenous students in my classroom, whether it was a mixed class or a class of primarily Indigenous students. Um, I always have Indigenous students in my class. So they really taught me a lot over the years, how to work with them, how to better work with them. And uh, so, for example, uh, then I got into teacher education and I got into uh, First Nations uh, teacher education. So uh, the one picture on the left here is me working with a group of Dene students up north. We were doing uh, an arts education class. So I asked them about the music uh, in their community because I know they still have the drum in their community. So uh, the students were teaching me how to do a tea dance uh, using the hand drum, the Dene hand drum. And then on the right is one of my colleagues uh, from First Nations University, Sherry Farrell-Rousset. And we were doing a uh, reader's theater, uh, reenacting the like right from the transcripts of the signing of Treaty 4. Uh, so this is the actual land where Treaty 4 was signed. Uh, so I, like I'd say, the other thing too, working on teacher education, I was out in the schools quite a bit. So I was uh, in a lot of classrooms and got to, uh, when I was observing my student teachers, I also got to observe a lot and talk to uh, a lot of very effective teachers at First Nations and Native children. Uh, Cree, Dene, Soto, Dakota, so because I worked in Northern Saskatchewan and Northern Manitoba and Southern Saskatchewan, I worked with very many uh, different indigenous groups. While I was in teacher education, one of the issues that I found is uh, 
all our theories and what we were teaching um, for effective teachers uh, was based on research with non-Indigenous teachers teaching non-Indigenous students. And I knew from experience that what worked in one situation did not necessarily work in another, particularly when there were different cultural students involved. So I started asking myself questions and, and ended up doing a PhD looking at uh, interviewing and observing effective teachers of First Nations and Métis students. So I worked with teachers in, uh, in urban schools, in northern schools, in rural schools, in band-controlled schools. So they were very, very different uh, in their approach, but there were some similar uh, some similar principles that they all followed. So one would be really a gifted math teacher uh, using games, for example, to teach math. Another one would be very effective, like in the arts. So while I was doing my PhD, of course, I wore Keith's ears out talking about it all the time. It's, uh, most of us do when we're really interested and passionate about the subject. And Keith in his patient ways put up his knee, but also talked about Cree concepts from his language that he said illustrated what these teachers were doing. So whether they were non-Indigenous teachers learning from their students or from community members or from Indigenous staff members in their school. They, uh, they were underlying these practices that they were using were Cree concepts, uh, both general concepts and concepts of relationships and education. So um, we decided to uh, put this together and write a book together. So this is the book uh, that we wrote, uh, UBC published it. And basically it provides a framework for thinking about teaching practice. Because what I found, there is no one way to teach indigenous children. Different cultures have very different ways of being, of knowing, et cetera. But if what we found was these principles give us a way to think about how we can move forward. And I see these principles evident when I looked at the Nanaimo Lady Smith webpage, for example, uh, alliances that have been made in creating uh, your uh, The uh, oh, I don't know what you call it. I've lost the name anyway. Or say, yeah, or say yeah, yeah, it's a phrase, say yeah, yeah, it's this framework, yes, yes. yeah. And you're but the alliances you have, uh, to with the different first nations and maybe groups in your area, so you know, like that's a Cree concept of social relationship mm -hmm. and how to be with one another. So that's what I mean about a framework. The other underlying thing that was really important for me as a teacher trained in Western theory and understandings was to, it really helped shift my view from a very content-based teacher to a more relational view of the world. Just another uh, point on the, on, the, on the background of the book from experience. At that time, uh, in, when I was teaching, I was teaching grades two, three, and four in the late 60s. You know, by the early 70s, I was teaching Cree at the university in 1973, 74. You know, it was uh, the first accredited course in, of Cree language at the university at that time. Then I taught, uh, I was, became a Cree language consultant in schools to have Cree taught in four schools in Northern Saskatchewan. 
And uh, so I was quite uh, uh, very strong on the language issue because this was already back in 1973. And uh, later on, I, I, got, uh, I tried to get a, a, a Cree uh, and Dene language uh, uh, immersion teacher education program. But it, uh, I didn't find any money for it, but I was able to get some money to do a, a regular teacher education program called NORTEP, Northern Teacher Education Program, which uh, way, way back in 76. So I got that uh, started and, and uh, it was a, a very important thing. And we integrated a lot of the indigenous uh, curriculum uh, uh, principles and, uh, and, uh, and, and developments of that time. So it's been, so it's been quite a while in regards to looking at the book when Linda was asking me questions, you know, I was, I was coming at it from a teacher, you know, from a, a community college principal, you know, from a, uh, I was also the head of Gable Devon Institute at that time. So one thing that I found is the teachers always talked about respect. You can't teach indigenous, you can't be an infective teacher unless you respect them. And what that was, was the counter to the, our colonial past in Canada. Uh, we know, for example, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission heard the stories, so many stories of what happened in residential schools. And of course, that was only one tool in the uh, oppression uh, of Indigenous people in Canada. So colonization is that whole process of taking over and controlling uh, indigenous lives, lands and resources. And through that, it rejects and dismisses indigenous people's languages, history and culture. So when effective teachers talked about respect, that's what they were talking about. They were talking about pushing back against that lack of respect that people have for indigenous uh, cultures, their knowledge that, you know, if we would have been paying attention a hundred years ago, I'm sure this land would be very different than what it is now. So anyway, colonization is a whole other presentation. So I'm just going to emphasize that Using language and culture and accessing that language and culture is part of the process of decolonizing. And one of the first ways you can do that is by working with elders, accessing knowledge keepers in the community. And this applies for anybody. Um, Ted said, mentioned that there were uh, people who aren't educators as part of this webinar. So these principles apply to education. Yes, but they're human principles. So decolonization, I mean, we've just had examples of institutional and what people call systemic racism in so many of our institutions in Canada, particularly lately in the healthcare system. So all of our institutions and all of our corporations really need to work at decolonization. And many of them are taking steps to educate themselves and their employees uh, about what it means to pay attention and learn from indigenous languages, cultures, and histories. So this is applicable primarily to teaching, but it can also be applied anywhere. This is the model that the principles that emerged from working with these teachers. Of course, the first thing that teachers talked about is unless you have a relationship with that student, they won't learn with you. They won't learn from you. So this uh, is of course the first area that you start building on, build those personal relationships. And it doesn't mean you're friends with students. It means you're more like one of the teachers said, well, it's more like you're the auntie. You're very strict with the students, but you are personal with them. You share human emotions and human stories with them. Then of course, what's the relationship like? 
who you're working closely with. So what's the relationship in the classroom? How are students interacting and relating to one another? Is there bullying going on? Or are they respectful? And this doesn't happen automatically. The teachers that I worked with did specific things and took initiative to make sure there was teamwork in the classroom, make sure there was working together other principles of Cree thought. Then connection to the process. So it's not just what the content, which Western trained education focuses on so much, but also how are you teaching? Are you teaching in a way where you have all power or are you sharing power with the students? Are you making uh, education dynamic? And by sharing power and opening up space in your classroom, that leads to students bringing in content from their own lives. And that then connects to the content of the uh, class. And like I said, this can apply to practically anything else, any other uh, working situation. So what? how do they may now the Cree guide us? Well, they have specific social relations to deal with this relationship with the student. And we're just going to talk about one today. In, in terms of uh, social relations, uh, we have about uh, five major uh, social relations, but I'll, I'll talk about the uh, Utuotemi twin. Whenever uh, we were making speeches, when I was listening to elders in the community, when they had big meetings, they would start a meeting, they would say, uh, which meant uh, uh, those with whom I have openness, you know, and uh, diplomacy, and uh, also uh, those with whom I have relations. But Utuotemitwin was also a form of relation, a very special form of relationship, because it focused not only on relatives, it focused on non-relatives. It also focused on uh, partners and non-partners. It also focused on alliances and non-alliances. So openness was a broad framework from which we operated on in Cree. It was open not only to people. Uh, in terms of our naming ceremonies and in terms of naming people, Ototemitwin means you are open to the world. You're open to the universe. And, and through that, the names start seeing evolve and they're connected with, uh, with nature. You know, the sun, the stars, you know, the, the animals, the fish, the plants. So you're, you're, the naming of who you, are, who, who you have identified with personally is already, is already being identified with the world. And in that sense, Ototemituin, you could see it in, the, in the modern uh, terminology. If you look at the, the clan systems with the Ojibwe, they call it the, the duodemic uh, structure. And it's very similar to the Cree in that sense. And they formalize their clans. In Cree, we don't. We go down to the individual level and the connection to the world. And that's how we, uh, and that's how we deal with it. So the openness is not, therefore not only openness to uh, parents, elders, and community members, but, it, but it's also openness to the world around you. So in teaching, what this means is you're open to diverse students. And this is a Métis teacher. The picture uh, is of a Métis teacher working in a school, in urban school in Saskatoon. And she was doing a language arts uh, activity with the students. And she had invited us to take photos. So we got this photo and it wasn't staged, but here she is. Um, with a Muslim student, a non-Indigenous student, a First Nation student, and a Métis student. So it's open to all. The other thing they're doing too is sharing food, which is so important in, in Cree culture. Uh, but also this openness means that you're open to sharing decisions with others. So sharing decisions with students, with parents, with elders, with community members. So just opening up your classroom. 
I mean, I'll add one more comment on the openness idea. Uh, in modern time, a lot of people have translated that to mean friendship, but it's actually, it's actually a, a form of openness because you have to be open either, even before you start friendships. It's openness from, from, from the beginning. And uh, so sometimes roughly it's translated as friendship, but that's uh, it's also in, in uh, broader terms, uh, 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 an issue of diplomacy with, at the higher levels. And that's what I found working with Keith with three concepts. You could translate it into an English word, but like the English word does not capture the understanding behind the term. So a term like ototemetuim, just, you know, like friends, does not capture that openness to the world around you and uh, where you see yourself as being embedded. Uh, in the world around you, in the physical, spiritual, social world. So, remember, we said, whoop, relationship with student and relationships in the classroom or in your team. Okay. So there's a couple of Cree concepts we're going to talk about for how do you build relationships uh, amongst the team you're working with or the class you're working with. In this case, we have a concept of a uh, win. And this happens in the classroom, but it also happens historically. I'm, I'm doing a, a PhD on the issue of land, you know, the Greek concept of land in our area, but also the history of the dispossession of land in, 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 in Canada, in parts of Canada. And uh, I, I knew that when the first people met with the Europeans, uh, we were, we had to do certain things by helping, supporting and helping each other, you know, not only with trade, but other aspects as well. So we see to an, is a, a very foundational element in regards to the thinking of the Cree. Uh, we're always uh, helping each other, you know, whether or not they are partners or relatives and so on. So you have this, we see to an concept that is uh, uh, based on, uh, on really the, uh, the the strengths of our people and, and how it extends outward. This helping and supporting each other uh, is what's really modeled for us uh, on a Soto or Ojibwe uh, school that I was doing a workshop in and we were broken up into small groups doing uh, drama. And anyway, we had talked about some of the health issues the students were facing. Uh, but we always try and go for work from a strength-based approach. So we asked the students, okay, what are the strengths of your community? And this group said, oh, we know. And so this is where students are showing us, demonstrating to us their knowledge, their indigenous knowledge of their concept of their community. And if I don't know if it's clear enough, but there's four students, there aren't any chairs propping them up. No. Each head is on the other one's knee. And I don't know I, if you've ever tried to get into this formation, but these kids were like, boom, and they just modeled. It, so oh. for them to verbalize or write a report on what are the strengths of their community, mm -hmm. I don't think they could have done it. But if you ask them to show you, I mean, these students obviously knew what the strength of their community was, how to support and help one another. My goodness, so if, I, this, if I was learning Cree and I just saw that word Wichihiruin and I saw those kids, I would know exactly what it meant. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, the thing is, is this really ties into to how we do evaluation in our schools and how we do evaluation um, everywhere. You know, often it's paper and pencil. And I think expecting all students to be good at paper and pencil, written English is trying to make everybody the same rather than recognizing the gifts and the strengths of different students. 
So another important uh, relationship when you're creating relationships within a team or within the classroom is the notion of... Which you have a need to win. Partnerships. Uh, yes, when you're doing uh, partnerships, which you have a need to win, when I was growing up, we started developing partners even when we were young. You had uh, different people you uh, went to work with or you went to play with or did other you know, activities with in the community. So you started having certain people that you partnered. So you develop a closer relationship you know, with somebody uh, more so than others. And you develop uh, these partnership systems throughout. Some people were more adept at uh, having different uh, partners, you know, having different smaller groups and et cetera that they partnered with. But it was important to realize what the partnership systems were and to realize what the interconnections were in the community. Sometimes it reflected, you know, that which existed from what the parents taught and so on. But sometimes it existed with the, with the youth, you know, what they themselves thought, you know, were the connections and the new partnerships. So partnerships uh, became very important. And when I was teaching in, in uh, most factory back in the uh, in, uh, in, uh, late 60s, early 70s, we, we did a lot of partnerships in changing curriculum with teachers, you know, with staff doing curriculum chains. And we also brought in the parents. You know, we had a trap line school. You know, we had a hunting school and we went out and uh, over there we had a, a situation where we had the tide come in the effects of the moon, teaching science, indigenous science. And we brought all of these things together, you know, uh, but we did it with a, with a strong partnerships within the staff and with the community. And we work with the community to move on. And that's why we, we also deliberately mentioned the, the, the partnership with parents and elders. And we expanded and, and it was very good for the students. You know, a lot of the students said, you know, they were very happy with their parents, you know, grandparents being part of this. They found value being in school, being with them. And they said, wow, you know, uh, geez, I forgot my, my, my dad knew all this stuff, you know, and, and this is what they know. And uh, because they knew how to, uh, with a tide coming in and the wind coming from a certain direction, they know exactly where to go. And uh, it, was a, it was a very uh, interesting experience, not only for us as teachers, you know, and as parents, but for the children as well. They saw that there was respect being paid to the, the people of the community. So that gives you a couple of examples of Cree terms and how they are uh, so pertinent to what we do in education. Um, also, uh, now going on to the third quadrant, that connection to the process, um, what really helped me understand is uh, how Cree's view learning. Yes, uh, quite often uh, we hear a, a lot of a, a good strong emphasis on indigenous knowledge. And uh, you know, people have identified that as IP, etc. And uh, when, I, when I started thinking about that, I thought, yes, yes, indeed, knowledge is very important. And we have a word like skeni tamuin, which means knowledge. But also, I started thinking when I was growing up, well, what did people really say? You know, are, are you knowledgeable about something? Or did, no, I, I thought back and I said, no, they tended to say, uh, can you still tell now? And so I looked at the word, which is our concept of understanding, you know, getting to know what is the meaning behind everything that we do? You know, how do we understand this? So when it's totemwin, Becomes to be a very key word, and then I noticed in the in the in the word itself, what was embedded in the middle of the word nisitotamwen, and then I realized that nisitotamwen was not only thinking about something, you know, it was or thinking about it in contemplation. It was more important that nisitotamwen itota at the middle of that word means do or act upon something. It was an action-oriented system of understanding. And it, was, and it was right there, smack in the middle of the word. I never noticed it before because I started doing the analysis, you know, breaking it down. And I said, wow, you know, and, uh, and I, start, I start doing that a lot more in my work. 
So uh, I understood very clearly that knowledge and teaching practice had to be uh, reinforced by action and understanding. And, and it was a, a very important aspect of, uh, of uh, uh, a message in our book. I, I love when we find uh, nuggets of magic or messages from ancestors that are hidden in the middle of our languages across this land. I, I find that on a fairly regular basis and I go, oh, that sounds, that sounds like a voice from the past often to remind me of things. So thanks for sharing that. Yes, thanks for the comment. We also have, uh, one of the essential things on philosophy is uh, the idea of uh, life and survival. Uh, the, uh, it is interesting that some of the key words that we have, life and survival is embedded in just about everything that we do. But when you look at the word in Cree uh, on, uh, on Pimacho, when it, uh, uh, we have a general word, life or survival. But if you look at key words like Pimote, Pimpata, run, Pimiska, paddle, Pimina, fly, Pimusine, throw. All of those words have at the beginning, pim, like in the essence of life and survival. Again, there is an interconnection with action and activities embedded right in the language. So it was a very, very uh, important uh, way to look at it. And uh, again, another example on action. We need action and interaction. And uh, it is not only action amongst peoples, it's looking at the action and activities of all, all life force beings. Of course, in Cree and other indigenous people, we include the sun, you know, the moon, the stars, and all other aspects that some, some, uh, some of our classification in English is a little bit different, like rock is considered, you know, a, a life force. And so we have all of these things and also spirit forces, even such things as ice and et cetera. Some of these have a little bit of a variety in different indigenous languages, but in general, you see this life force system expand, ex, uh, extended beyond what we would call anthropocentrism, you know, a, a people-centered approach toward to a more inclusive all-around approach, you know, of the, of the universe of the world. And, uh, and uh, I, I, in, in this area, I just make a, that we are all uh, life force beings, and uh, we we carry out our self determined actions, you know, for living and survival. I might add that uh, it's not only an issue in our book. We talk about self determination. You need to combine your forces with a system at large. You know the 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 societal determination. You have to be a strong part of that as well, and also what we call in the middle co-determination, where we have partnership systems, you know, uh, 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 getting together systems, you know, to, to get certain things which I, which I have labeled in the book co-determination. So it's done at three levels, at self-determination, co-determination, and societal determination. So action is very important in the process, as is interaction. Just a, another example, we, we look at interactivity and we look at an important word like uh, we come out to in, 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 in your, uh, the very first one. Uh, it's sharing, uh, every day we tell stories to each other. You know, you come into the classroom, sit down, or you go to the cafe and sit down and talk. You're sharing information about what happened in the election last week or what happened, you know, in the classroom last week, etc. So we have what we call we come out to in, because a lot of it, are also very personal stories, you know, about what's happening. But the next one is uh, Wichitoin, helping, we've already mentioned that, uh, helping supporting each other, but also Sita Scotland, it's supporting somebody, especially when they're in deep distress. You know, if something happens to them and I, and I, and I, and I go to different situations, somebody has, you know, uh, something terrible happened to them, and our people come together to, to support, and we call that Sita Scotland. We, we help and support each other. And uh, also we work together. We took the stem between is the last one. So uh, again, uh, uh, to, to emphasize, we, we, we need all of these action, interaction and understanding when we're teaching the knowledge base to the students. 
Okay, so if we're going to uh, talk about uh, applying this to education, uh, we looked at uh, the Cree concept of teaching. Yes, yeah, so on, on this one, when I was teaching in, uh, in the 60s, uh, well, obviously we went to Skidamaga and we were involved in teacher-directed learning, but a lot of the things were coming into play with uh, language labs, math labs were starting to form. So we were getting into what we call individualization of instruction. A lot of the people were starting to focus on child-centered learning and individualization of instructions in an age sixes. And in Cree, we call that uh, skidom master, you know, where you're teaching each other. When I was a kid growing up, I was uh, teaching oneself. You're, you're teaching oneself. And you, we, we used to go out and watch what our parents did and what, and when we went and did it by ourselves, you know, without their supervision. And that's how we, I used to, we used to uh, go camping together out in the bush with the, uh, other young people, you know, when uh, we were 10, 11, 12, and our parents weren't around. We, we just went out and, and, and that's how we were raised. So we, we learned by uh, uh, what our parents told us and, and elders and, and, and also, uh, you know, everybody, but we, we also taught ourselves, you know, in the process of doing things. And the last one we look at is, uh, I started thinking about the, these things, these two great emphasis in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in my uh, teaching uh, on, on, on education. But I started seeing that what was missing was uh, this interactive base. A person doesn't learn a book. You're learning all the time in interaction with others. You're learning all the time in interaction with the environment. It's always an interactive situation. So we look at the word skinomatuin. We are always teaching each other. Every day, all the time, we are teaching each other. So those are the three levels I look at. Skinomagain, very important, you know, a, a good form of teacher-directed learning and individualized, you know, self-directed learning, but also teaching each other that type of teaching learning situation. So just quickly uh, to look at those in terms of education. Uh, teaching another. Uh, one of the things that uh, teachers talked about was uh, which translates roughly as belief in yourself. Uh, you had to have that belief in yourself as a teacher that you could actually do it. So like for education, you access content uh, from authentic Indigenous sources. In this case, it's an elder uh, teaching students uh, land-based knowledge, how to start a fire using traditional uh, Dene tools. Uh, yeah, so first the elder teaches or shows her how to do it, then she tries. Uh, teaching oneself, uh, it, there's an important concept to in Cree, which is, do you want to say it? Skinamaswin. No, this one here. Oh, Tipanimiswin is, uh, Tipanimiswin is, uh, starts, uh, particularly we started using that word, you know, and in, uh, in the young youth, you know, as the youth are growing up, they're starting to have a greater authority over themselves. So we use this word, the person is starting to have, and, and when you have uh, grow up to be adults and live on your own, they say, it depends me. So, you know, the person has authority over themselves. And we also use that in terms of governance. Dependimism is an important word for us. So in this, uh, the teacher's responsibility is to set up learning experiences. For example, have the materials in the classroom that students can interact with. Or for example, in the other photo here, uh, taking students out on the land where they teach themselves uh, and learn about this was uh, students were studying water quality. So the students were out collecting water samples. Finally, Kiskanon Matuin, teaching each other. It really is recognizing the strengths of self and others. So teachers organize activities to make sure interaction happens. Here we have a, a talking circle 
uh, where each student takes a turn sharing about a particular topic. Uh, and here we have a group of students doing some group work together. Now, with COVID, I totally sympathize with teachers who are trying to reorganize their classrooms to set up meaningful learning experiences where students can interact with one another without being close to one another. So I, uh, I really respect the challenges that you are facing as educators and as people in other walks of life. So the three forms often are used all together, uh, but basically what it does is it opens spaces in the classroom. Uh, teaching oneself and teaching each other open spaces in the classroom for students to bring the knowledge and understanding of their own community and their culture as they live it into the classroom. And when you use these three structures and think about the principles that Keith talked about in Cree philosophy, um, what they do by implementing these ideas of partnership and action and interaction and being open to others, you restructure and decolonize those educational relationships so that students are put in positions of leadership in the classroom and they take leadership. Leadership is not solely in the hands of the teacher. And that's how they achieve or strive for dependence when that concept of coming to have authority over oneself. And I think what, you know, like the outcome really is, it develops self-determining graduates who can work with others in the working together idea, but also uh, when you're teaching yourself, you take initiative for yourself. So I think just uh, to kind of draw our presentation to a close, we see so many positive initiatives taking place. Good gosh, when I started teaching, there weren't published, you know, Pauline Johnson was supposed the only published Indigenous author that I knew of. But we've come so far in having Indigenous authors, Indigenous uh, playwrights, uh, different people who are, you know, now we have some content, some good authentic cultural content to draw from. We don't have to use that stereotypical uh, pan-Indian uh, materials. Uh, so I think when students start teaching each other, teaching themselves and teaching others, they learn how to express themselves. And creativity is uh, so important for young children to really feel that spiritual part of themselves and connect uh, to their little spirits where they just really enjoy and are having fun with what they're doing because that enjoyment and that emotional connection to learning, they now know that that really helps in memory and remembering what they're learning. So just to have this is a picture of a group of students from Black Lake who did a puppet show on self-esteem. And it was unbelievable in two weeks how it really helped them overcome shyness in the classroom and got them working together in a really and having fun together in the classroom. So we'd just like to wrap up our part by sharing this Ooh. word. I got five minutes. No, <laughs> we're gonna get to the last word. Get the last word. I was gonna explain that for a whole philosophy of a philosophy, but uh, we'll leave it short. I would like to say this much at the beginning. You mentioned, you know, you have uh, teachers and others. Mm -hmm. One of the concepts that I did include was a we teach again which was the building of alliances, you know, mm -hmm. inside the school and outside the school. Very, very important. 
uh, I saw you when you were explaining to me, Ted, about the word sietya, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the word that was used in there. That, you know, when you're coming together and combining together in, mm -hmm. in many forms, it is a very, very, it builds strength. You know, it is a base that you can, you can work from. It's, mm -hmm. It is not only an individual, a small group, it's a broader scale approach. And it's a very important aspect of educational development. But we always have to go back to focus on the channel. Mm -hmm. So we have to look back at awasis, which is like our Cree word for child. And it's interesting, again, when we, when we look at that word, it tells us something. That middle of the word means was, wasu. It, it, it is a word that means that it shines or gives off light. You know, our, our children shine, you know, they give off light to us, you know, from a, from a Greek perspective. Mm -hmm. That's just at the end of the word simply signifies that the child is smaller than us, etc. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a little being that, that shines and, and gives off the light. Too often education in history, we have seen the light getting dim, you know, with colonization, residential school, everything like that. The light of the people, the children had been dimmed. What you are doing now is to bring back the light, you know, to bring it so that the children are signing, so that indeed they are excited, they are moving in a dynamic fashion towards the future. How I was it? Beautiful. I love that uh, final slide for us too. Uh, we're trying to surface those educational concepts that uh, by asking our Indigenous communities and lots of it like you've shared with us is uh, embedded within that language which of course is embedded within that land that we stand on. And so it's encouragement for all who've joined us today that uh, seek out that language that's uh, underneath the territory that you stand on that comes from that territory and uh, find those things like oasis where the light is embedded in within the words and those concepts are embedded within those words because I think it gives us an opportunity as an organization to become stronger and to become better on behalf of the next generation that's coming right so that we do a good job for them. Oh. Keith, Linda, there's so much more, as you said, we could talk about too, uh, about education, about other organizations and other sectors and uh, how those concepts that uh, come from the language and the teachings of uh, ancestors and centuries uh, could come to the surface today and perhaps guide us on an entirely different path. Um, but we are going to call this one to a close and I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Tom Quaston to uh, close our house. Uh, your concepts of openness and respect and relationships will stay with us. Uh, the one that will stay closely with me because it resonates so true is that concept of being an auntie. Uh, so <laughs> harder for us uncles, but uh, I understand the concept completely having been uh, raised by many aunties and still guided by many aunties. So over to you, some question to close our house. Linda and Keith Guye. for joining us everyone uh, hopefully we'll see you next time too uh, Keith and, and Linda thank you so much for sharing your knowledge it was <laughs>